Hello everyone. I'm going to talk about Optorama, Optimal Oblivious RAM. I'm Gilad Asherov, and this is a joint work with Ilan Komogatsky, Wei Kailin, Kartik Nayak, Enoch Viserico, and Elaine Chi. Our agenda is as follows. I'm going to start with the introduction, which includes the problem definition. I will then give a very short tutorial on the progress of Oblivious RAM from square root ORAM to Optorama. And I will conclude with telling you a little bit about our techniques as much as the time will allow. So what is the problem that Oran comes to address? Suppose we have some secure processor and an untrusted memory, or in a more modern view, suppose that we have some client that uploads this information to an untrusted server. Even if the uploaded information is encrypted, the access pattern, the memory locations that the client accesses, reveals some sensitive information. For instance, suppose that a medical doctor uploads all the genomic information of its client to the cloud. Suppose also that the doctor always accesses regions that relate to the kidney. Even though that the data is encrypted, the server can infer that the patient has some kidney problem and not, say, a heart problem, and this is a leakage that we want to prevent. Oblivious RAM solves this exact problem. It can be viewed as a compiler that takes the program that the client wishes to execute and converts each memory access to some sequence of operations on the physical memory. It shuffles elements around the physical memory and moves blocks around to hide the logical access pattern. In particular, it also introduces some overhead. Every access in the logical program is translated to many accesses by the Oblivious RAM compiler. Oblivious RAMs were introduced by Goldrich and Ostrowski. The informal definition says that the access pattern, the memory locations that the client accesses, can be simulated and they are data independent. As we mentioned, Oblivious RAM introduces some overhead, and we have a known lower bound that this overhead is at least log n for a logical memory of size n. That is, if the logical memory is of size n, every access in the original program is translated to at least log n operations amortized. This lower bound holds even if we assume crypto. Some words on our model. We assume that the server is passive, that is, it behaves just like a memory and is not allowed to perform any computation. We assume that the word size of the RAM machine is log n. This is natural as otherwise the client cannot describe an address in the memory using a constant number of words. Moreover, we assume that the client memory size is constant. In these settings, the lower bound is omega log n and we have 30 years long line of research to try to match this lower bound. The starting point is the work of Goldreich showing a square root ORAM, and the last work in this line is the beautiful work of Patel et al. from two years ago showing a construction called Panorama. Panorama came very, very close to, to match the lower bound. They showed a construction of order log n, log log n, just log log n gap between the upper bound and the lower bound. In our work, we we'll present the first ORAM construction that achieves overhead of log n, matching the lower bound. Our main result is an ORAM construction with log n amortized overhead. This is asymptotically optimal. The construction achieves computa computational security and matches the lower bound of Larsen and Nielsen. And when we replace the one with function with a random oracle, we achieve also statistical security and matching the lower bound of Goldrach and Ostrovsky. As I mentioned, the model is when the word size is log n, client memory size is constant, and the server is passive. Our construction is in the balls and beans model, which means that every data block is treated as an opac. Our construction is not practical, and even though it is asymptotically optimal, its concrete efficiency is relatively bad. Besides our main result, we also have another, another result that might be of indep independent interest. A key building block in our construction is an oblivious type compaction. In that problem, we have an array of elements in the memory in which some of them are marked. The goal in oblivious type compaction is to move all marked elements to the beginning of the array. We don't require stability. We don't ask that if one marked element appears in the input array before another marked element, then it will also appear before that element in the output array. We just ask that all marked elements will be moved to, to the beginning of the array. Solving this problem non-obliviously is very easy. 
we can just scan the array once and write down all marked elements and then scan the array again for the second time and write down all elements that are not marked. But how can we do it obliviously? Apparently this is not an easy problem. We know that deterministic constructions that achieves it in order n log n, this is essentially just performing an oblivious sort on all elements. Uh, this is an open problem since 95, um, which this work also shows a solution that reveals the number of marked elements and works in time n log log n. It took almost 20 years of work to get rid of this leakage. And it's also worth mentioning that there is a lower bound of omega n log n if we ask for stability. Our result shows an optimal solution for this problem. We show a deterministic oblivious stack compaction in order n. It's worth mentioning that there are two follow-up works. We showed uh, in a follow-up work that will appear in information theoretic crypto how to achieve uh, a linear type compaction that also supports pa good parallelism and Dittmer and Ostrovsky showed an oblivious type compaction in linear time with a smaller constant. In the next few slides I want to show the progress in oblivious RAM starting from the square root ORAM of Goldreich to the hierarchical solution and to the beautiful work of Panorama and finally talking about our work, Optorama. We start with square root ORAM. So in order to hide what we want to access, the first thing that comes to mind is to shuffle the entire memory. So let's say that the client shuffles the entire memory and it can also store this permutation pi, this mapping. Whenever it wants to access some element i, all it has to do is to compute pi of i and then access that, that uh, memory location to retrieve i. The server cannot learn what was accessed because it doesn't know which element actually resides in that location. When the client wants to access some element j, it's going to compute pi of j and then access the relevant element. However, if the client wants now to access i again, it cannot go to the same memory location because then the server will see that the client accesses the same element. The client cannot, the server cannot see which element was accessed, but it does see that, that the client accessed the same element more than once. Square root ORAM solves this problem by introducing another layer, which is called the shelter. So we have a shelter of size square root n, and we also introduce square root n random elements, dummy elements, to the record array. The record array is shuffled, and now when the client wants to access some element i, it's first going to scan for the element i in the first layer, in the shelter. If the element is found in the shelter, it's going to access some dummy element in the record array, and if it doesn't find the, sh the element i in the shelter, it's going to compute pi of i and access i. After i is retrieved, the client is going to write it in the shelter. Now when we want to access some element j, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to uh, scan for j in the shelter. We are not going to find it, so we're going to compute pi of j, access pi of j, find the element j, and write it back to the shelter. Now if we want to access the element i again, we're going to scan the shelter, find the element i in the shelter, and therefore we are going to access some dummy element in the record array. And we can make sure that we never access the same dummy element twice by introducing some label for each dummy element. So after square root n accesses, the shelter is going to be full and therefore we have to rebuild the entire structure. The rebuild uses oblivious sort which is going to cost order n log n. So we are going to pay some expensive operation every square root n accesses and this is essentially why um, our access is square root n log n. Hierarchical ORAM allows us to pay the expensive operation, the oblivious sort, over a larger number of accesses. Instead of having just one shelter, 
we can think of the hierarchical construction as having many shelters. Each shelter will have its own shelter. We have log n levels of double incisors. With each axis, we are going to perform some lookup in each level, and every two to the i axes, we are going to rebuild table ti from the content of all previous levels. As a result, after n axes, we are going to rebuild the last level from all previous levels. We therefore are going to pay the expensive operation of n log n only after n axes and not after square root axes as it is square root or absolution. More explicitly, the amortized cost can be described as performing log n, log n lookups plus the amortized cost of rebuilding the levels. In previous works, the expensive rebuild used oblivious sort. When we put the cost of oblivious sort in our expression, we get log square n amortized cost per axis. The beautiful work of Panorama has the following ob observation. If we assume that the input of each level is randomly shuffled, then we can actually rebuild the level without the paying the expensive oblivious sort. In particular, they showed how to implement a, a rebuild of a level, which is in fact some sort of a hash table, in n log log n, assuming that the input for that rebuild is randomly shuffled. Moreover, they also observed that each level by itself is randomly shuffled. All elements that were not accessed in that level are randomly shuffled from the previous rebuild. However, recall that every 2 to the i accesses, we are rebuilding level i from the content of all previous levels. While each layer by itself is randomly shuffled, the concatenation is not necessarily randomly shuffled. Therefore, they have to introduce another operation which takes um, few arrays, each one by its own is randomly shuffled, and interspels these arrays together into a randomly shuffled array. This uh, interspells operation, they show how to implement it in cost of n log log n as well, where n is the sum of the sizes of all arrays. For conclusion in Panorama, we have to update the expression that we just saw and also charge for the cost of interspersing arrays. In Panorama, we have total cost of rebuild the level in n log log n, lookup in each level log log n, and intersperse n log log n. Putting those in the expression gives us total cost, total amortized cost of log n log log n. In addition, um, we have to improve each one of those operations in order to get, to get an uh, optimal construction. In Optorama, this is exactly what we, we did. We showed how to fix each one of those parameters. We showed how to um, improve rebuild to linear time, how to improve the lookup to be constant time, and interspells to be of linear time as well. Only if we do all of those, we can actually get an optimal construction. In the remainder of the talk, I'm going to show some of our techniques. I'm going to describe a little bit about tight compaction and also a technique um, that is called packing. So tight compaction, where is it being used? There are many different places where tight compaction is being used in our construction. The first example is when we want to rebuild the level. We sometimes have to get rid of the dummy elements that were introduced. In square root theorem, we could have done it using an oblivious sort. Here, we cannot use oblivious sort because we want to do the rebuild in linear time. For the second example, we observe that oblivious tight compaction can be used for interspersing few arrays together. I'm going to elaborate on that in the next few slides. Uh, Suppose that we have two input arrays that are randomly shuffled, say is of size uh, i0 is of size n0 and i1 is of size n1, and we want to intersp intersperse them where we assume that each one by its own is randomly shuffled. So in order to do that, we are going to generate an auxiliary array which has exactly n0 zeros and n1 ones. We are going to generate that array 
uniformly at random from all possible arrays that has exactly n zero zeros and n one ones. Then, if we are going to obliviously route um, the two arrays into that, according to that auxiliary array, namely, wherever in the auxiliary array we have a zero, we are going to place an element from the first array. And whenever we have one, we're going to place an element from the second array. We are going to end up with an array that is a random permutation of uh, the, the, all elements in the two arrays. In order to see that, where well, we are getting all possible permutations, so we have n choose n zeros to, um, to choose this uh, auxiliary array, and we also have n zero uh, factorial for shuffling uh, i zero, and n one factorial for shuffling i one, and in total this gives us n factorial possibilities where n is the sum of the two sizes. The challenge is how to move these elements obliviously, how to move actually to place wherever it's written zero in the auxiliary array, an element from i0, and whenever it's written one, to place an element from i1. Panorama showed how to implement it in n log log n. We are going to show how to implement, implement it in order n, using oblivious tight compaction. So how does it work? Well, the idea is to start with uh, generating this random auxiliary array, uniformly at random, and then we are going to run tight, tight compaction on that auxiliary array. The result will be that all the zeros are going to the left, and all one are going to be at the end of the output array. Now if we put our um, input arrays i0 in the beginning and i1 at the end and run exactly the same tight compaction but in the, re the reverse order. Namely, wherever we add some move ball in the tight compaction, we're going to remember to record uh, that move ball operation and perform it in the, in the reverse direction. As we can see, we're going to end up with inter interspersed array that exactly matches our auxiliary array, our target array in the beginning. And this is a mix of uh, the two input arrays. We're going to get an array that is randomly, is a random shuffle of the concatenation of the two arrays. I'm going to sh talk a little bit about uh, our oblivious type compaction to give a little taste of how the construction looks like. So we have an uh, input array of size n where some elements are marked zero and some elements are marked one. And our goal to put all the zero elements before the one elements. First, let's count the number of balls that are marked zero and then the number of balls are marked one. In the output array, up to this mark, the number of uh, balls that are marked zero, we want to have only zeros. And after that mark, we want to have on all the one balls. So we're going to mark all the elements that are misplaced. We're going to mark by red all the ones on the left side, and by blue all the zeros on the right side. The number of reds always equal to the number of blues. Moreover, all we have to do now is just to swap every one element from the left side with some blue ball on the right side. In order to do that, the algorithm will use a part bipartite expander graph. The bipartite graph will have a constant degree. There are n vertices on the left side and n vertices on the right side. We place our input array in the left side. So the algorithm is as follows. <clears throat> Each vertex looks at its neighbors of distance 2. Those neighbors are always on the left side. If two vertices that are marked with opposite colors have the same neighbors on the right side, they are going to be swapped, and we are going to remove their color. This requires in total uh, n d square work, and recall that the degree d is constant, which means that overall this is a linear amount of work. The claim is at the end of this procedure, there are not going to be so many remaining swaps. And why is that? Um, this is because of the expansion properties of the graph. 
Let's consider the set of survivors, those elements that finished the algorithms and were not swapped, and they're still marked. Um, we cannot have too many survivors. If we have a set of size n over 200, say, of uh, blues that survived, and n over 200 reds that will survive, the set of neighbors must be disjoint. If they have someone in the intersection, then they will not be in the one of the surviving elements. However, using the expansion property, we can show that every set of size greater than n over 200, the number of neighbors must be greater than half of uh, the right side. That, me that means that overall, after the swaps, there are not going to be too many remaining swaps. At this point, after we perform the loose swap, there are not so many uh, elements that are marked as, um, that are still marked. At this point, what the algorithm is going to do, it's going to run what we call a loose compactor. Loose compactor is uh, a variant, is a weaker variant of tight compaction. So if in tight compaction, we have some marked elements and want to move all the marked elements to the beginning, in loose compaction, we have some marked elements in the input array, and we want to have the output array, um, and we want that in the output array all the marked elements will appear, but we don't care in what order. We just need that the output array will be smaller than the input array. We must might lose some of the non-marked elements. So after we perform loose compaction, we're going to stay only with the marked elements, those elements that are still want to be swapped. We're going to continue recursively. We're going to recurse, and then we'll have another loose swap and another loose compaction, loose swap. At the end, when we come back to from the recursion, all those red elements and blue elements are going to be swapped. Assuming that those elements in the recursion were swapped, we want to show how to also swap the elements in our, um, that remained after the loose swap, all we have to do is to go back to the loose compaction and do reverse routing. Namely, um, we're just going to reverse route. All elements uh, that came back, all the, all the move operations that we did in the loose compactions, we are going to do in the reverse uh, order. I'm going to do it again, loose compaction gave us this. When we do, we're coming back from the recursion, all the reds were moved, were uh, changed with the blues, and then we're just going to do reverse route, and all the zeros will appear now before the, all the ones. I'm stopping at this point with uh, tight compaction. I did not describe how to do this loose compaction. We, are going, we, we did it in order n as well. I'm going to talk about another technique that we have in the paper, and this is packing. So what is the idea of packing? We are working in the RAM model where the word size is W. Say we have n balls, each of size D bits. How much does it cost to sort these balls? Using classical oblivious sort, we have to pay D over W n log n. This is because we are going to put D, the D bits in D over W memory words. But what if D is much smaller than W? What if one memory word can contain many elements? This is the idea of packing. We are going to pack a lot of balls into one memory word. As a result, we can sort now in time D over W n log square n. We are not going to um, observe that here we don't going to pay for the ceiling of d over w. What does it mean is that when n and d are small, say that n is like uh, w to the fourth, which means polylog size, and d is logarithmic in the word size, we can sort actually in linear time. But where is it being used? Remember that in order to enjoy it, this linear time sorting, the number of elements must be very small. It's going to be something like polylog n. 
So where it's been used? So recall that this is the um, ORM construction, is the hierarchical construction, and um, in fact, if we look closer, then each level in our ORM is arranged as a sequence of bins, and the elements, each element resides in some random bin, and the size of each bin is something like polylog size. Previously, to build the structure, to st the structure of this uh, hash table of a bin, it's inside a bin, we needed to use some oblivious sort, which gives us some log log n over n. Now, using the packing trick, trick, we can get rid of this log log n over n. So for conclusion, we show that there exists an ORM with order log n blow up, which is asymptotically, asymptotically optimal. We also show the hash table that um, is, being, is built in uh, linear time on permuted input and supports lookup in constant time. And we show an oblivious type compaction in linear time. Thank you so much for joining me.